but the more we know Jesus, the greater the wonder becomes. And that will be true not only in time, in time, but also in eternity. Is that? And that's so true. It is. The more we know about him, the more we're amazed, the more we want to know. Right? That's correct. And it's true. Sometimes you get to know people and say, hey, not so great now that I know him. <laughs> And that's very important, Pam, because there's a two, there's several types of knowing. One is the knowledge you can have as a college professor, even knowledge up here about something. But there's right. also the knowing that comes from a relationship and from the heart, right. and that's the important factor. And that's what John is also calling us to, is that not just to have a head knowledge, but also have a heart knowledge or experiential knowledge. We want to welcome uh, our online guests as we are gathered here at Kirkville United Methodist Church. Some of our number are not here with us today because they're uh, doing other things and um, that took them away. But we welcome you to join us as we continue our study of the Gospel of John. Today, we begin and uh, our study of John chapter 10, which is a very important um, chapter. Of course, every one of them in John is an important chapter and very unusual and important to the gospel message that we have to offer the world. Um, I sent out by email uh, the questions uh, for today. I do that on Monday. And so uh, hopefully you have those that you can help follow along uh, with our discussion. And again, I have my phone here. If you're visiting with us online and you would like to uh, make an observation or <coughs> uh, have a question, you may do so by calling, uh, texting my number, 315-345-6534. We had problems on Sunday with Facebook and going on live, and we're hoping we won't revisit those problems today or in the future, but who knows. Let's have a word of prayer today. Gracious living God, as we come together, we come with different needs. We know that some in our number have lost a family member. And we also know that there are those who are struggling uh, in other issues in their lives. And so we join together with them. We pray for them. We come alongside them. We also wish happy birthday to a wonderful woman, Al Smith, who is 90 years old. And we just pray that you might bless her this day. Gracious God, bless us this day as we once again open up your word. May we not just read its words, but may we encounter the word who is Jesus Christ. So Lord, be with us, inspire us, and inform us that we might live more closely to the image of your son Jesus and that we might be able to discern more fully and completely your will for our lives. And this we ask in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please, if you're online with our streaming, if you find that you have a difficulty hearing us, please text me and let us know. I can adjust the microphone, and that would be very important. Again, we begin our reading this day with John chapter 10. Please follow along with me. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters the, by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, 
they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. We'll continue our reading, but I thought there was enough in that brief passage for us to consider and discuss. And so I, the question is, it's a very easy answer to this question is, who is it that Jesus is uh, making his comments to? The Pharisees. The Pharisees. And the, it's important for us to realize that and to also then to translate what that means for us in our world. The Pharisees was a sect of Judaism. There were many different sects. There was the Sadducees, okay, the Pharisees, there was the priests, there was also then the Essenes, which you don't hear too much about, and there was the there are other uh, there are zealots, there are other groups that we read of within the gospel that made up um, Judaism at that time. Just as much in Christianity, you find there are different sects within Christianity today whether you're Presbyterian, whether you're Southern Baptist, whether you're Methodist, uh, we can have all different types of sects, uh, S-E-C-T-S. But there's also, besides denomination, I have to say that because some of them might hear me say X-E-X, and it's not S-E-X, S-E-C-T-S. But there's, even within churches, we find that there are different groups. We find that there are elders in some church, okay? And uh, then there are deacons, and then there are, you know, common, uh, I don't mean common in a negative sense, the ordinary congregational members. Um, There's lay ministers. There are lay ministers, lay speakers, lay leaders, such as Charlie, lay servants. So we have different uh, names and titles that people go by, and that's interesting for us. But what's important about the Pharisees is they were not priests. They were not officially the teachers of the law. Oh, they were. Nope. Uh, oftentimes you'll find that uh, Jesus will address them and they'll be called the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The teachers of the law were a special group of people that were teachers that dealt with and led uh, conversations regarding the law, application of the law for common people. Were they rabbi then? Because Jesus was <laughs> Rabbis were a particularly different type of uh, denotation. Um, oftentimes they wouldn't necessarily be of any of the other classes. They, they would be special teachers. Oftentimes Jesus was called a rabbi, even by the Pharisees, um, because he was an itinerant preacher. Um, so some of the teachers of the law might be called rabbis, but... Uh, uh, rabbi also denotes uh, special people that had a special gift that uh, arose in the community, and uh, some were official rabbis that went to training at different schools, and others uh, like Jesus who came from nowhere. And uh, so that's an important denotation too. But Pharisees, as you particularly realized, were lay people, but they were the the religious leaders. So they might be people, like in the Methodist system, who might be serving on the board of trustees, or administrative council, or other official capacities. They're not ordained. They don't have, they aren't particularly teachers, necessarily. They are uh, leaders. And particularly, those leaders um, typically were people who were a little bit wealthier class, could we say? It seems to happen that way, they're isn't tasked, it? They're tasked with governing an uh, organization. That's correct. And so some of that, the Pharisees, would be part of the Sanhedrin, which was part of that ruling group of people in the establishment of the religion. Um, now, didn't they attempt to follow Moses' law, or did the Pharisees have a different law than Moses', Moses law? Uh, Pharisees were pretty rigid in following and applying uh, the law of Moses, okay. yes. And the teachers of the law would be a little bit more, um, they would interpret, so you might have different, interpret. yeah, more interpretation and application of the law. Um, and the Sadducees, which is another group, they uh, um, 
they were not as much followers of the law, that they would go against the law, but they would cons they would be, um, oh boy, I don't, I don't want to get myself in that hole. Um, they would tend to be more liberal or progressive today. They would be considered the liberal progressives of today. The lower, the lower commoner? No, they were, they were educated and, and educated. but they would disagree. Like they didn't agree, they didn't believe as the Pharisees did in resurrection or eternal life. Okay? And they would challenge Jesus on that. So who that is Jesus speaking to is the Pharisees. They are the the lay people, not ordained if you want to call them that, who are leaders of the religious community. Okay? So he's speaking to them, speaking to leaders. Why that's important for us is that as we listen to these words, we need to apply that to us. If we're involved in the church and we are leaders in the church, we just don't come on Sunday morning. We don't just necessarily come and do a Bible study. Um, that would be good. Most people should. But uh, we tend to be more leaders within the church. Then these words are very much applicable to us. Okay? So, truly, truly, I tell you, Pharisees, you religious leaders, okay, Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Now, why would Jesus, and I didn't write this in our study questions, but why would Jesus use the, the allusion to a sheep pen and sheep? It's an enclosed area. It's a closed area? Okay. The temple was like a... a Oftentimes did yeah, use, as you were saying, yeah. the analogy of the the sheep and the shepherd and mm -hmm. such like that. Um, but why? Why? The sheep are his people. Okay. And where did that come from? Did the idea just come from him? No, from the Lamb of God. And okay. So we find that. He took care of the sheep. I think care of his children. Throughout the Old Testament, the imagery of God's people as being um, sheep and Lord being their shepherd. So we have the famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The sheep are followers. The sheep are followers. But all through the Old Testament, um, the sheep are an analogy of God's people. And so that's why he builds upon this. This is something that they would understand. Number eight, two. Now, let's ask the question of then, what is the pen? Now, some sheep were out in the fields. And the shepherd would guide them, particularly during certain places and times of year, to the sheep pen. For protection. For protection. For safety. For provision. Okay. But what would the pen represent for us today? Our church. Our church. Okay. Now it could be that we could look at this church and the people that are part of this church as being a pen. It's not meant to, you know, pen us in. No, but like a sanctuary, a safe place. A safe place. Mm -hmm. A safe of provision. A place of provision and protection. Um, and there are sheep that are out in the fields, but they're more vulnerable. Right? And so those who are sheep uh, like to gather, this is we're gathering, and we gather in the pen, where uh, um, we find that provision and that protection. And that's good for us to understand. Well, Jesus wants to include the people that are out in the field, too. 
because he has his own flock, but he also wants to include the others. That's a very good point, and that comes in uh, with another statement that he makes farther down the line here. Um, so there are sheep that are out there wandering, maybe with a shepherd or without a shepherd, and um, God wants to be the shepherd of his people. Jesus wants to be the shepherd of his people. So he's, he's drawing upon that analogy. Here the, the pen was, at this time was those who are officially and actively involved. I want to say that again, officially and actively involved in the Jewish faith. At this time, there are people who were, quote unquote, Jews, who were not necessarily actively involved in their faith, even in their communities. In their different communities, there might have been synagogues, and there have been persons that would be involved in that. But there are some people who were not as involved in the synagogues or the active participation of their faith. The same thing happens today. We find there are people who, would, if you ask them, they consider themselves Christians. However, they are not actively involved in the practice of their faith. And there are those who are part of the sheep pen. They are actively involved in their faith. So that's important for us to define, to understand what Jesus is describing, because the Pharisees were leaders of those who were actively involved in the practice of their faith. So he's speaking to them. But Analoging, analoging up to today, that's why that whether you're in that pen or you're out in the field, if you want to communicate to your religious leaders, you need to you need to come into the, into the pen for the education and for the strength. A, of a lot the, of people are the outside sky. of the pen, whether it's then or now, are suspicious of the church of the institutional yeah. church. They then have their own personal private beliefs, which might be a mixture of what they've heard or taught, been taught in the past, but it would be syncretized or it would have other ingredients from their culture intermixed within it. Because so might, they're more vulnerable to misteaching. It might be, and based on where they are, it might be their survival tactic. It could be, but they just are not, because they're not actively involved in their faith, they don't, they aren't open, they are not exposed to regular good teaching. Do you think that good leaders are, should not just be in the church, they should be out, I know, I know what your answer is, but they're out in the community yes. and involved with everyone and teaching every chance you get yes. by your, just by your, your way or your actions. The Pharisees tended to absorb their time within the pen. Okay. But what they needed to be is, yes, they needed to be out there. And when I say leaders, that means more than relating today pastors. Uh, we have different responsibilities. And every person who is active in their faith is a leader and needs to be active within their community. Um, not necessarily uh, saying that they need to be um, on these different organizations that are non-religious organizations, but they need to be engaged with their community. If they're a member of the fire company department, they bring their spirituality with them. If they go to school board meetings or you know any type of involvement and encounter with the community, Chamber we are to bring our faith yeah. with us. And that's one of the problems here, just as we have now, we tend to make the church a, a pen, a corral, where we come for protection and provision, for spiritual food, emotional nurturing, but we tend to come and we're part of the pen and we leave the others outside. Okay? Uh, that's not what Jesus did. He went out. That's why he went to Samaria. That's why he went to Galilee. He went to places besides Jerusalem in the center of the faith. That's it's a very probably, good point. Yeah, that's probably also why the Pharisees had difficulty in understanding yes. Jesus, was because Jesus was saying some different ideas that the Pharisees weren't used to hearing. Because they weren't out with the people. That's the problem so with when faith becomes a reli uh, religion and institutionalized, what happens is the institution becomes um, more important in the survival 
the driving of that institution becomes more important than the vision of what that relationship is supposed to provide. And that's something that we always need to remember. We come together to feed our spirit and our soul, but where our vision is to call us outside to be able to bring others into the pen, if you want to call it that. Um, so we have that little definition that's important. And he says that anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Now who would it be that would climb in to the sheep pen? The devil. The devil, okay. Yeah. What else? Man <coughs> To mess things up. Okay. Well, non believers is another idea. These are, I think, leaders. So he's talking to the Pharisees. You may be religious leaders of the institution. You, didn't come through the gate. you gotta come through the gate to be really part of the pen. Now the other question is who's the gate? Jesus. Jesus. And another question is who's the shepherd? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> okay. Now, and then here's another one, another individual that's mentioned. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Who is the gatekeeper? God. God. Can we be a little bit more specific? <laughs> God, the Father. The Father. Well, well. I, in my own Pentecostal understanding, would say that it is the Spirit. Okay. Oh, the Holy Spirit. No, and, and Paul would clarify that if we were looking into Romans and stuff, that it, it, we come to faith in Christ through the work of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay. We don't come to, to Christ on our own. There's a gatekeeper. Right. May I also then suggest to you the gatekeeper is the Spirit, but may I also suggest to you that the gatekeeper is you and I. Oh. We're the keepers of the gate. Because we let Christ in. We let Christ in. Or keep him out. Or keep him out. Yes. Right. Very good. We also allow other people to come in to the pen to experience the community. If we feel where so. the spirit of Christ is to be alive and living. Go ahead. If we feel secure to let them in, we're very selective over, over who we let in. Whereas Jesus let everybody, everybody in. in. Okay. Right. Well, why would then? So why would someone come over the fence and not through the gate? They don't want to be identified. They don't want to be identified. Okay. So is that why some of the leaders are farther down? That's why some of the Pharisees and the leaders back back then. They're considered hired hands that won't won't stand up for the sheep. Yes. Because because they aren't they're out for themselves. Mm -hmm. and they're, not, they're not committed. They're not you know and that's why they lay down when the wolf comes like you know. Jeremiah the, in the Old Testament not, has a lot to say regarding those leaders um, in the Jewish faith, the shepherd of the people, and. He condemns the shepherds because they have been self-serving, self-seeking. Right. And so one of the things as uh, my calling as a pastor is something that is always very, um, something that I have to focus on in question is, am I a good shepherd? Am I just a hired hand? And quite frankly, I've known some people who are in that shepherding role as a pastor. See, was it interesting to use the word pastor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a pastoral imagery, uh, like a shepherd. Okay? Um, and that's what pastors are to be, is to be a shepherd. That a lot of shepherds, or those who are part of the institution, are hired hands, are slack in their shepherding of the flock. And nice can be disruptive. <laughs> and instead of coming in, through the gate, and the gate is Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. they try to come in through other ways. I have an agenda. I have a political agenda. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked a, little about, a little bit about politics on our lunch before we came up here. 
and you know we can get in the wrong direction when you just be looking at politics. What we need to do is that some people come into the church because of a particular political agenda. And the only agenda that we are to have is that which God then defines for us. It doesn't mean that we don't make political choices or social choices. But we focus on what Jesus wants, and that informs our choices. So we come through Jesus, not because of an agenda. And there are a lot of people who enter into an institution because they have an agenda to push. Some enter into the institution because of other needs that they have. I need self-aggrandizement. Okay? I need uh, people to need me. So I make a dependency from others, uh, a following. I need to get my own following. And uh, uh, some people um, are predators, quite frankly. And they realize that in a pen, you can do damage. I can do damage. Okay? And that's happened. And I know that's been particular. It's not just within um, the Roman Catholic Church, but you know there's been some predators that entered into that mm -hmm. um, for the purpose of causing harm. Or the scouts. Or, now I'm just, just, just talking about sexually. Mm -hmm. But some people are predators emotionally, financially, other type of things. Those who come in who are true shepherds come in through the gate which is Jesus Christ. That means my, I, I first have to come to Christ. I have to live my life for Christ. Mm -hmm. And Christ calls me to be a shepherd, and I come in with Christ. And that's an important distinction. The first thing that struck me when we got to know you was the first thing you cared about was our soul. More well, than anything you. else, you cared about my soul. Thank you. That and makes me feel, when I go to bed at night, it makes me feel like, well, I guess I'm being an okay shepherd. Yeah, yeah, I, that, and that's what you, they all should do. All, all the pastors should do. And there are very good pastors, and there are those who are not. And I don't want to, I'm not, no, no, it's not the purpose, but, you know, that. we can find within an institution of the church, just as politicians or uh, teachers or in any institution, you can find the good and the bad. Okay. <laughs> well, the way you are, it doesn't, it doesn't happen to be that you're only concerned about your future. Okay. You're concerned about the people that you, that you have served with in the past. You don't forget your friends. Okay. You know, Jesus doesn't forget about us. No matter what name we call ourselves, we are, you know, he cares for us. If he cares for us, then, then we, we need it to care for others too. So, you know, we have Lynn who's a Baptist, Southern Baptist, I think. You know, um, that's okay. We have a Presbyterian, that's okay. Oh, forgive me, thank you. We have a former Roman Catholic, you know. Um, it's not the names that become important. The real pen is the pen of those who have, truly have faith and follow Jesus Christ. That's the important thing. They feel the spirit. Yes. So the gatekeeper, uh, he doesn't define who the gatekeeper is. We know that uh, um, that the uh, they enter through the sheep pen by the gate, and we know he defines himself as the gate. He also defines himself as the shepherd. But he leaves kind of open who the gatekeeper is. He's kind of the gatekeeper, too. That's right. Yep. But he doesn't call himself the gatekeeper. And I think that's one of the reasons for that is he wants us to scratch our heads and, re and help us to realize that if the spirit of Jesus is in us, we also open the gate okay, where the gatekeepers to, where the gatekeepers to let Jesus into other people's lives. Right. What an important role that we have. Well, it would be the spirit of God because the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Yeah. So the spirit opens up for us and God opens up the gate. Yes. Okay, so now we go on. He talks about that. Uh, and he says, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice, not the gatekeeper. Why is he talking about the gatekeeper? The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, meaning who? The shepherd. He doesn't mention the shepherd yet. 
But it has to be the shepherd because in the next line it says, He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So while we may encounter Christ within the church, Jesus leads us out. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes the church is at fault because we just have our whole life within the pet. Well, and, shep- and, and good shepherds are supposed to take an interest in its flock and go one-on-one and walk side-by-side with them. If they don't, then you're really not being a good shepherd. He takes them out to influence other people. So we are to go out to influence other people, but we always come back to the pen. Yes. Because that's where we find our nurturing, our care, our protection and provision. So he leads us out. So those who are truly Jesus' sheep listen to the shepherd and are led out of the pen. But we listen and follow the shepherd. The church will oftentimes try to do outreach. And sometimes outreach is good. But sometimes our outreach is more proselytizing to our particular pen than it is reaching out to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Understand that? I'll let you think on that for a little bit. In other words, we can promote our own pen. We can go back to the pen to replenish ourselves. That's correct. So but if we all stay there all the time. That's right. So if all of a sudden what I'm what I'm interested in in my neighbor, other people that may not be actively pursuing their faith, um, I'm interested in not having them become Methodist or a particular Methodist church. I'm interested in them coming to know Jesus. And I don't care if they wind up going somewhere else. My concern is they know Jesus. And the pen is not a particular church. The pen is the true church of Jesus Christ. That's what we should be concerned with. He calls his own sheep by name. I want you to think about your experience of Jesus. Have you heard Jesus call your name? I know that I have had Jesus call my name. It may not necessarily be an audible voice, but there is this calling that I experienced deep within my soul that I had to seek him out. Oh my goodness, you know, I heard a clear voice. You heard a clear voice, yes. There were times I could hear... Which was amazing. Yes. There are times I've heard a a clear inner voice as well. But uh, we recognize that each person that comes to faith in Jesus Christ, it's not just I'm calling a group of people. I'm calling you. I have... You know, Jesus is saying, I have you in mind. You're Jesus' preoccupation. I have Lynn's life in mind. <coughs> We're called individual. And each individual is called by Christ to follow. I seek, I seek him for strength. That's you what I call him the most. When I'm, when I'm down or getting very negative, I I look out for strength. It's good. Otherwise, I'll give up. I don't want to give up. It's good. You see, those who, some would not care and even seek Christ out. Well, okay, I believe enough. I can then go out and have add my other beliefs, my other gods, my other idols, and I'm okay, right? And that's, that's a lie. It's self-deception. Those who truly are Christ hear his voice, are attuned to his voice, and seek to hear his voice. You seek him your entire life. There's never a moment when you're, oh, I know it all now, I'm done. No, you don't. You seek him to the day you no longer take a breath. So prayer becomes something different, too, because prayer is not just, okay, I'm going to spew off all my interests and concerns and my agenda. But prayer is also a matter of tuning our mind and heart to listen. That's why we call this the Word. 
more frequently, yes, God does speak, Christ does speak through the Spirit. But Christ speaks through the Spirit through the revealed Word. So we listen. That's why I love spending so much time in the Word. And because I've heard more clearly Jesus speaking to me through the Word. Okay? Uh, and that's important. Uh, when he has brought them out, he goes ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. What is it that Jesus wants us to do? Where we are, the circumstances surrounding our life, he brings us out. What does he want us to do? Make follow disciples. Him. To follow him. Jesus comes Jesus. us. He comes us. Now, I'm going to use Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as an example. He uh, came out as a pastor. He saw things that needed to be addressed. But he followed Jesus. And every single thing that he wanted to have done, he followed Jesus. He fought with some others, uh, Malcolm X and some other groups, Panthers, the Black Panthers and others, who wanted more violently change he wanted quick change. the social. Yeah, quick change by about two violence. And he didn't do that. Yeah. And the reason why he didn't do that because he was following Jesus. And so it's important that while we seek to, if we're called to impact change, it is important how we do it as much as importance of what change we want to see happen. We follow his lead. How does Jesus and how would Jesus want us to do that? So um, I didn't want you to think that just because some people have agendas, we don't come to Jesus for the agenda. We come to Jesus personally for our relationship. And then whatever agendas that Jesus raises within us, then we follow him to work for change and transformation. They sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. What is it that I te we teach Lydia, Bethany, and, and Daniel, her grandmother, and me, about strangers? Stranger danger! You know, we don't teach about stranger danger in the church too much. Unfortunately, the children, you really shouldn't just teach stranger danger because a lot of danger could be people that you know. That's true. So you have to teach them danger, period, and examples of things that could be So what we need to teach is, is discernment. Right. So there may be someone who comes over the fence or the gate, or over the, the pen, who is a thief and a robber, he says. Who are those? They have different agendas. They're predators. Okay? They can be in the pen, but they don't belong there. And how do we know who is a stranger and who is it we should run away from and who should we run towards? You know, there's not a set group of rules that we could delineate. Out. You can tell by their word if they're not following Jesus' word. Okay. Um, they should all give you like a red flag or a clue. Okay, very good. So what happens is if, if we're following Jesus, even people who are predators could use um, religious language. Yeah. But they still be a predator. They can be very yeah. sly in covering up what their true beliefs are to try to, to get you to believe what they, you know, to trust them, and then they'll go after you. That's correct. I think usually they try to run down their own path, their own pathway that is deviated from what the main group is working on or working towards. And that, oh, well, our way is better, our way is better. That's, that's a little bit of a warning flag. That's very true. So if we're staying close to Jesus, if we're reading the word and praying, if we're reflecting and we're listening for Jesus, then when all of a sudden someone who looks good, sounds good, somehow we have this discernment within our heart and spirit, something's not right here. 
Yeah. If something's not right, I'm going to run away from it. But it's Jesus. We listen to the Holy Spirit giving us counsel. Yes. So the best way that we can protect ourselves, and there may be some people within the pen, not just enemies outside, but within. Uh, the way we protect ourselves is by keeping close to Jesus, listening to Jesus, and following Jesus. So when someone tries to lead us astray through some type of teaching or, you know, it's hard to give an example, um, we then automatically are suspicious and we don't run that direction. And they may be deliberately test in them by themselves to cause the harm, or they may not even realize that they are doing harm to the Good body. point. So all of those who may try to do harm may be deceived themselves mm -hmm. in not realizing the harm they're causing. Correct. And, uh, Until they're called out by, by yes. somebody. And, and they may be thinking that they're doing good. Right. Yeah, they may think they're doing the right thing. They believe in what they're saying. They believe in what they're saying, even though what they're saying is crazy and off the mark. Okay, so that's just the opening verses of this <laughs> chapter 10. It's quite deep, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. He used this figure of uh, speech. Notice they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So if we are close to Jesus and listen to his voice and train ourselves, we'll be able to discern Jesus' voice over that of the stranger. Jesus used his figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them because some of those Pharisees were also some of those strangers. Yes. They were, right. and their hearts were not open. Yes. They had their own agenda. They had their own agenda. Yes. Now, go ahead, and uh, uh, Charlie, and go ahead and read from verse 7. And I'll tell you when to stop. Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are the thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Go in and out and find the pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I can come that might have life. They might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth the life for the sheep. He that is a hireling and not the shepherd, all the sheep are not. See the wolf coming, leave the sheep. Flee, and the wolf catches them, scatter the sheep. The hireling will also flee, because he's he is a hireling and does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I know mine. The Father knoweth me. Know I am the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. Sheep which are not of this fold, also must I bring. Shall hear my voice, be one fold, one shepherd. Doth my Father love me? I lay down my life. I might take it again. No man will take from me, but lay it unto myself. Power to lay down, the power to take again. Commandment I have received from my Father. Very good. Now you're reading from the King James, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a little bit um, tougher to, to follow through. Angelina finished yeah. some good points here. Um, she says, um, any word teaching or counsel conflicting to what Jesus taught in the word. And she referenced Psalms 1, Bless the man who walketh not in the counsel of ungodly. The Pharisees had difficulty understanding Jesus. The hearts were hardened to everything Jesus was saying. They were not of his fold. Why do you understand the speech? And he blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Very good. Very good responses, Angela. Thank you for bringing, bringing those. <coughs> he says, um, Truly, truly, I am the gate for the sheep. We already knew that. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Who are those that came before him? Well, he's not talking about the prophets. Well, I wouldn't think they would be saying it was Isaiah or Jeremiah or any of those prophets or Moses or that. So who has come before him? Probably the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're okay. Affecting the people. Okay. So before he was at physically and literally on the scene before them, those who came before him, the thieves and robbers. Now certainly John the Baptist wasn't a thief or a robber. 
So we have to ask ourselves, who is he speaking of? Who are the thieves, those who came before me? And in some way, Maybe I have thought... Kings and kings of the different countries, and, you know, who rule, those who are rulers. You know, I, I, I have to think, I've pondered this, uh, even though I admire Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, Moses, um, John the Baptist, um, in comparison to Jesus, they had their flaws and faults. God may have used them. And I also have to look at the fact, okay, that I know I as a pastor have flaws and faults and I may have my own agendas that I'm not even realized but and I could be corrupted as well we don't have Jesus as God so that's why he's perfect so in other words before Jesus came we were up to I have to determine what is true from what is not true and I have a very weak standard except for what the community said from the Old Testament. Like I said, there's some things that happen in the Old Testament. And I've taught the Salem Fellowship that there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. We learn from the bad, we learn from the ugly, as well as there's good. So how do we determine what is the good, the bad, and the ugly? All these forerunners may not have made, were receiving messages, but they may not have understood what they were being told. In okay. other words, they were giving predictions of what was to come without truly understanding what was to come. Okay. I mean, how do you explain Jesus to someone in advance? Yeah. You know, he was a unique personality, and no one had ever been like him. And so they really didn't know what was coming. Okay. That's very true. But we also find that they were corrupted human beings. There's only one person that was not a corrupted human being. That was Jesus. Jesus. That was Jesus. There was, while the Holy Spirit might have touched and worked within other people, um, the prophets and whatever, at the same time, the Spirit was more fully in Jesus because he's both man and God. And so he becomes the key. This is very important. He becomes the key to our being able to understand and discern what is the revealed truth in the Old Testament. He becomes the key. And so he was able to, that's how I interpret it. It doesn't really clarify, but that's how I interpret it. I want to make sure you realize this is my interpretation and not necessarily Jesus spelling it out. Jesus doesn't spell out things. He allows us to think. And so he says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. So he's saying, you can go ahead and, and quote Moses to me. You can quote this prophet from me. You can try to confuse the issue. But you're using the Old Testament as a thief and a robber to make your agenda to promote your agenda. Um, all the people up before him did good things and bad things. Yes. Whereas he did not. And likewise, since Jesus, there are people who have done good things and bad things. And the only way we can discern between the good, the bad, and the ugly, there's a lot of things that were said, you know, even slavery was justified by certain Christian people. Okay. And we know it's wrong. That's his, his history and situations. Yes. So the only way we realize is Jesus is the key to the truth. Also, that is important to us. In, in the Old Testament, there was like, you know, war and murder and all kinds of things. And Jesus' way is through love. Mm -hmm. You don't. That, that so wasn't he true. is the key. He's the key. And it's through love, though. Mm -hmm. So there are sometimes there are certain stories in the Old Testament people have a hard time with. I can't believe that God would do that. Though it's said that God did that. And by knowing and getting close to Jesus, we're able to discern, okay, this is a human religious outlook 
that was not necessarily God. They may have attributed this to God, but that does not mean that God ordered it, wanted it, or supported it. You know what God, I mean? God created everybody with free will. So he wasn't totally responsible for everything they did. Sometimes when they did something wrong, he used that to get the message across. But he, you know, he gave people free will, so they did some of the things that weren't what he wanted. That's right. So it's important what he's saying is that I'm the shepherd. You need to get close to me. I will clarify the truth for you. Even today, as we look back on Christian history, if we really want to know the truth, we have to define the truth through Jesus. The more we come to know Jesus, the more we're able to discern what the truth is and what we are to follow. And that's why we need to study the Word so we can understand and get closer to Jesus. Right. Because we don't know His Word. That's right. So he goes on, so he says that. Uh, he says, they only come to steal and kill and destroy. This is an important one I would highlight. I didn't highlight it in this Bible. I should have. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So he talks about those who come through the gate, verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. That's internal salvation. That's also being saved from moral error. Let me put that out there. Being saved from moral error. I want to be saved in this life from moral error. I want to find salvation for eternity. And also Jesus comes into our lives because he doesn't just want to give me eternity. Because if we read verse 10, he says, I have come that they, you and I, the sheep, may have life and have it to the fullest. Having Jesus in my life, I feel that my life has been made full. Fuller than I would ever know had I not followed Jesus. And that's one of the witnesses we give to other people. Someone's going to say, my life is good. No, life is meaningless without Jesus in it. <laughs> So we can share back to them that, and we can also say, yeah, but life can be better. You don't know how good life can be. I love the quote, and I've used it before, and you, you, you hate my quotes because I come back to them all the time. So, like good and bad, the other one. Um, or God don't play games. But um, another quote is from uh, uh, King Arthur in Excalibur, the movie, the, the book Excalibur. And what she, which Arthur declares after looking for the Holy Grail, looking for the answer, didn't find there was nothing in that Grail to give to his life. He pursued it through religion. Okay, then he makes this comment: "I did not know how empty was my soul until it was filled." In other words, we may think we got it all. We may think that we're full. But we don't know what we're missing until God brings that fullness. So there are people we talk to every day. They may not be dreadful, rotten, bad sinners, though they are. Uh, we just can't tell them that. Just like we're dreadful, rotten sinners who need Jesus. But they think they're pretty good. Yes, exactly. They don't know how good it is. Could be. They don't know what they're missing. See, that's yeah, what we the extra toppings. That's that's what we need to share with people. We don't need to point out, well, you know, you're a rotten sinner. I remember you did this, and this is wasn't in your past. You know, we don't need to do that. We just need to share what the goodness that Christ has brought into our life, and then, um, you know, they can say, how can I have that goodness? How can I have that? That's why I appreciate when we're gathered downstairs and we're laughing and picking on one another. We can, we can experience that love and the joy and the peace, even though we're different. And we know that's Jesus. Whereas in our world, what's happened? All those differences, we call each other name, both sides of the fence. We cast stones. We look for other people's faults and flaws instead of looking for the good 
And all we do is divide. And what do we do? We destroy and kill. And that's what's happening. So anyways, let's move on. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So if we're going to represent the shepherd, what should we do? We should lay down our lives for my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We're going to hear from Hugh Smith, who's going to be back with us in September. He's an ambassador for the Voice of the Martyrs, a former pastor that I served under years ago when I was a young man. And um, he tells a story. He's been there. Uh, people who uh, stand up for Christ and have been in jail, who have been imprisoned, who have been abused, who, fe- who know what lack is because of their faith. We have been spared that. It is my belief that that's soon going to be over and that we're going to be also a minority who are going to be persecuted because of our values that respect freedom of choice, that respect uh, individuality, and integrity, personal integrity, will become unpopular. Well, I kind of hope that the glasses have full of that and I'd like to see that we would become the majority it would be. in the world. Except that we also have Jesus taught us that before his coming, yeah. we'll experience that persecution. But it doesn't really matter. If we make up our decision and we're going to follow Christ, right. whatever comes. That's why I shared downstairs that with my grandchildren, as I feel that uh, maybe the end is more uh, more apparent than I, than I might have believe. I I fear for them in their future and what they're going to experience. Yeah. So I'm going to make I'm going to, I'm going to fill their lives with Jesus' love and my love as much as possible. Because you know, Jesus may not come in my lifetime. It might come in theirs. And tribulation might come in their lifetime and be lesser in mine. And I want them to know how much they love. I'm, I'm seeing... I'm seeing some little glimpses of positive things through this COVID thing. And we do not, like, like Pam alluded to, I think there is hope. There, oh, can, be, there can be light at the end of the tunnel. It all depends on how much how much we want to open that opening to let the light, to let Jesus' light. But you know, they, even if, you know, I'm not painting a picture of darkness, because even if Christ comes back, he brings back the light and the truth. And I heard someone speak this morning about, oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And that was always the call of Christians. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Even if it means shortening my life. We, you know, come, Lord Jesus, come. And we know from Second Peter 2, is it? Uh, is it 4? Uh, uh, that God is not slow. As most people... Um, count slowness. He um, delays uh, so that others have the opportunity to come to salvation. Right. And I, and I think, too, that all these missions projects are becoming a lot more important. And anybody that hasn't been on a mission project, the backpacks, the school supplies, the, the, the lunches for the, for, the, for the homeless in the Samaritan Center, I even, Cindy and I even talked with the milk supplier because it was an area that the kids weren't getting milk. They don't have, they didn't have the vehicle to get the milk, even though it's free. So slowly we're starting to realize it's like, wow, I didn't know there was such a need. Sure. It was uh, my sister's church, there's a lady guardian, like, she bought shoeboxes. And the reason why is she was a kid who got a shoebox when she was younger. And she knew how important it was. So she collected all year long to bring in those shoe boxes so other kids can you know God's love through that. One of, one, of Joanne, one of Joanne's neighbor was saying, told us that uh, America has an abundance of water, generally, clean water. Yeah. There's other countries that don't have the clean water right. to drink and to bathe in. So the um, Jesus, as you know, compares himself. There are good shepherds. There are hirelings. 
and we should always be careful of the hirelings we follow because they may be good but then when the hard stuff comes they may abandon the flock mm -hmm. their self-interest may not be their greedy and such but we realize you know um, some are not as willing to give up their life and I, I oftentimes question myself that when I hear of a pastor in Iran who was willing to go to jail and be separated from his family and watch persecution. And I, you know, I keep on saying to myself, am I willing to go that far from my sheep? Um, you know, it, it, it is how far are we willing to go uh, to self-sacrifice? Am I willing to give financially? If I'm willing to give my time, if I'm willing to give whatever I've been given, am I willing, how far am I willing to sacrifice? And I will always fall short. Other pastors, good pastors I know, will always fall short because we're not Jesus. But Jesus will never abandon the sheep. And that's basically what he says here. Then there's another question here. Um, he says, um, okay, I must. Uh, I, there, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. Who are the sheep that are not of this sheep pen? They're, they're the Gentiles, aren't they? The non-Jewish people. Okay, they're the Gentiles because they follow several different types of religions, okay. multitude religions but and ideologies. He's bringing them in also. It's not just the children. Because some of those are sheep, but they don't know it yet. There's some of those people who are going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through someone or something, and um, and all of a sudden will check Christ out and become a sheep and come through the gate. Or get, like, don't know. Or get like an awakening, yeah, like a sense of okay. knowledge. There may be people who are Islam, Hindu. There may be people who are who are different nationalities. Um, there's going to be, you know, so what happens is there's a broadness, a diversity of a God's acceptance. All depends on who hears the voice and responds to the call. It's not our call, but they hear the voice of Jesus. We may be useful in that, but they ultimately listen to the voice of the shepherd. Well, they, we would hope that they would see the Christ in us and want to know how to come about the same things. Yes. Now it says there that um, there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus is the one shepherd. And the flock is not a Baptist church, Methodist church, Presbyterian Jesus church. It's, it's our belief of the universal church that we teach, but we tend to be sectarian. Uh, we want to build our own little fiefdom. And that's not what it's about. It's about building Jesus' kingdom. Uh, this is another important point here, verse 17. The reason my Father loves me is I lay down my life, only to take it up again. Verse 18 is so very important. Underline that one. No one takes it from me. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own cord. We cannot say that the Jews crucified Jesus. We can't say the Romans crucified Jesus. Jesus gave his life. He could have avoided it. Pilate didn't take Jesus' life. He gave his life. The, the thing that's so amazing to me is he gave his life for us. For me, for you, you know? Nothing he could have saved himself and he chose yeah. not to. He, or he chose, chose to save us. save us. So it's voluntary. No one took his life. He gave it up. And there's a lot of people who would say, why would you want to find someone who's a loser? He died. He was crucified. Oh, you will hear some died. critics that will say that. He didn't die. He didn't die. That's true. He's still here. But also, <laughs> he, he gave his life. He yeah. did not. He certainly willingly surrendered it. He did not his earthly life. He did not have it taken 
from the Lord. But he came back to bring it to us. That's true. And so that's that's important for us to then measure our willingness to sacrifice. How do we willingly sacrifice? Um, so then the Jews heard these words and again were divided. Oh yes. Many of them said, He is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of someone possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Referring to when he previous passage when he opened the blind man. we got to check how far we've come along. I know it's 2.06. We've gone an hour. Um, but let me uh, just read through the rest of 10 and see if we can pull out some uh, quickly some highlights. Uh, then came the festival of dedication in Jerusalem. That festival of dedication is Hanukkah. Okay. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews were there, gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. Hmm. And that goes into a question that I'm... I'm, uh, Is... Has God determined who are going to be his sheep and who are not? No. Some in the Christian community would say yes. Hmm. Well, he tries to guide people to, to Christ, which is what brings him to, to, into the show, to become part of the sheep. It, it's a question about, uh, which we have a lot of discussion between Presbyterians and Methodists and Reformed regarding predestination. Okay. That's what we, that kind of speaks to. Right. Because you are not my sheep. Well, can't they become sheep? Yes. Yes, if they open up their heart to Jesus. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. No one can snatch them from the hand. What type of feeling did that give you in your life in Christ? Security. Security. That's another question that we're not going to delve in theologically, but I bring raise it. There's a debate over eternal internal security. Um, Baptists would feel eternal security. Once saved, always saved. That that even if you fall away. If you spit on Christ, you say, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. And go live, trip the light fantastic in the world. But you know, you, you're, you still have your salvation. But if you're still mad at God, and you're still, if you get mad at God, but you still follow the faith, and, and don't, I mean, we're all sinners, but you know, like, you're mad at him, but you still follow him, but you're mad at him. You're not, not really turning your back on him, but if you're mad at him, he still loves you. He's yeah, still I'm reading through the book of Job right now, and yeah, that was Job's problem. He, you know, he's mad at God. You've targeted me. Mm-hmm. Why did you target me? And you know, what have I done to deserve this? And his friends kept on saying, "Oh, that's a sin to be able to talk back to God." But what's neat about both the Psalms and also Job is that. We can be mad at God. God can take it. But what about if we turn away from the practice of our faith? What if we turn away from God morally? He still loves us, and he's hoping for us to come back to him. He still he, he still watches over us. and he t- I mean, that's my own, you know, I mean, that that's what happened to me. I turned my back on him, but I came full back full circle. But you came back. You came back. What if you didn't come back? We, we may turn away, but God doesn't turn away from us. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, what happens if if we don't come back to Him? Then we're, we know what, out of luck. Now, that's what eternal security right. differs. Yeah, because they'll say that secure, even if you walk can. away, yeah. okay, yes. you, you can never walk away fully. Mm-hmm. Because you either will come back or your 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 salvation is secured for you. 
Um, we Wesleyans are different. In that we say, you can walk away. As long as you have life and breath, you can come back. But if you walk away and you don't come back, when you die or Christ comes back, it's too late, baby, now it's too late. <laughs> here's, a, here's a good line from Angelina. I like this. She says on a personal note, I wish Jesus would simply show himself during injustices and others rather than just suggest his presence. What determines whether you are his sheep if you hear his voice and obey? So that's right. Uh, that's one of the questions of which uh, I asked. Uh, why? No, they said, why don't you just tell us? Why don't you just show yourself? He says, I have shown myself, and you didn't understand. What number is that, Charlie? Four C. Four C. In the back. So. What happens is that the Pharisees were correct. Jesus suggested. Jesus healed. Jesus said, I am the Father of one. You know, but they said, why don't you just show yourself? Why don't you just make it clear? Why don't you just tell us once for all? So the answer is, why doesn't God just, or why doesn't Jesus just make it indisputable? Because they would dispute it anyway. Oh, okay. Because they dispute the if truth they, anyway. If they disputed all this that he said in the beginning of chapter 10, you know, and he, they weren't really listening. The Pharisees they weren't really listening. listening because they had their good life. They had, you know, they, they had their good life. They had their money. They had their position, you know, and they just thought he was another prophet. And they really didn't believe everything. It's also when... The, the, it's so direct and right out there. Mm -hmm. Irrefutable. We don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus suggests and hints at and points out, you know, those who have eyes will see, those who have ears to hear will hear. Mm -hmm. And those who are not predisposed will not. It's interesting that in the book of Revelation, we come to, uh, and there are people that differ over the, uh, the process of how Jesus will return. But it, uh, there are many who believe, particularly Baptists, uh, that Christ will return, and then uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, because they'll see his power. And uh, so, uh, in the face of an overwhelming power and authority, what do you have to do? Self-interest says, I bow the knee. Okay? But then it's interesting because it also talks about a thousand years, and there's another rebellion. Now, why is there a rebellion when it's been so clear that Jesus is who he says there is? And then there's yet another Armageddon, or a battle to end all battles, in which God wins, those who are against God don't. Why would there be some who understand who God is who would rise up and reject? Why? Would he again give choice? You always have a choice. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that some people, as I've heard it said, I don't know if it's C.S. Lewis, Lewis well, who it is that I read that said this, but uh, they said that I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. There are some people who just, by their predisposition of their personality, because we can't see what heaven is really like, nor do we know what hell is really like. C.S. Lewis did say, I do not know the temperature of hell. <laughs> I don't think I want to find that. <laughs> That's correct. Right. So, so um, we have all sorts of ways, and so it comes into a discussion of eternal security. Are there some people who are destined for destruction, and some people are destined for salvation? And you can find passages to go along with that. And this one is one of the passages that those who like eternal security. Um, the predestination, those type of thing, will use this passage 
uh, to support their argument, because that's what he seems to be talking about here. Um, so he says, I did tell you, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish, no one can take them from me. What comfort that gives me is that so long as I'm following Christ, no matter what circumstances or problems that I face, no one can snatch me from the Father's hand. I add a caveat, though, except for one. It says, no one. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. The church can't. The government can't. Nothing, no problem or circumstance can snatch me away from God. Only one person can. Me. No one can snatch me away from God except me. My choice. So that's interesting. I have a choice to make. And again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to him, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you because of them, but you blaspheme because you, a mere man, claim to be God, and Jesus does not deny it, does he? Is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father sent as, as his very own and sent into the world? Now he's quoting from the Psalms. From David, are we not all gods? We are all gods. We are gods because we have the choice of determining our destiny. We are gods. That's what he meant. Okay. Now why didn't he just come out and say, I am. I am the father of one. He did say that. No, I, you're right. I'm blasphemy. In your eyes, from your perspective, I'm blasphemy. But the truth is, I am God. He didn't come out and say that. Instead, what he did is he gave this, referring to the Psalms, are you not all gods? So if I say that I'm God, how am I not wrong? Or son of God, he says. I am God's son. Do not believe me unless you do. I do the works of the, my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. And so Jesus left town, crossed the Jordan to a place where John had been baptizing in his earlier days. And there he stayed, and many people came to him because they were called, they heard the voice, they came to him. He came to them, but then he left. They came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. In other words, Jesus is vague. And that's the answer to you, Angelina. Jesus sometimes sounds vague because Jesus, as God, will not take uh, the power of our choice away from us. We have to look at the evidence, we have to weigh the evidence, then we have to choose. Why don't you just show yourself? I have revealed myself in so many different ways. Are you willing to see it? Are you willing to hear it? So choose this day. Choose this day. And that's the purpose that John found within these words and teaching of Jesus. Now know that only in the Gospel of John does he talk about himself being the shepherd, the gate, and that analogy. John is the one who promotes that. And that's why the Gospel of John is so important. And what he was saying in his witness in this Gospel, are you seeing, are you hearing? More than that, if you see and hear, what's making you delay your choice? If you hear my voice, don't wait. Choose. So next week we'll go into chapter 11. So I'll send out those questions on Monday. And uh, uh, again, like Angelina, send in your responses. I pass them around Angelina so people can have your responses and they can read them. And you, you answer, don't be fearful about what you write because you do a very good job. Uh, let's have some prayer. That's a wonderful job. That's a wonderful job. Gracious loving God, we thank you and praise you for your word. We don't know why we're so privileged to have heard your voice and responded to your call, but we are thankful. 
We know there are others who are not listening, though you are speaking. We pray for them. May we be the gatekeeper to open up the gate that they might be able to hear your voice and that they might come through that gate into the fellowship that we all can share with you. For this we humbly ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Hope to see you on, uh, well, I won't see you, but you can see us, on uh, Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock. Have a good and godly day. So we have Michael Glory okay. saying hello, amen, discernment. Doing very well.